Hello, hello. Today we will have a neat chat uh, with Dr. Manu Malbrin, who is a world expert on intra-abdominal hypertension. Hi, Manu. Good to see you. Hi, Jean-Louis. It's a pleasure uh, to see you virtually. Well, thank you for agreeing to have this short conversation. And let me ask first, uh, are we often missing intra-abdominal hypertension? It can be associated with many things, right? Yes, I, I think. And, and if you don't measure, uh, you may miss it. Uh, and it's also present in some uh, internal medicine conditions, uh, like in patients with cirrhosis, uh, patients with hematologic conditions and big spleens. So it's often overlooked, I guess, because it's relatively unknown, except from the critical care and the trauma setting. Yeah, and we can separate intra-abdominal hypertension and the worst form, which is the intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Sure, I, I think it's a continuum which goes from normal pressure to increased pressure. Likewise, as we see it with increases in intracranial pressure. So any compartmental pressure increase uh, is a gradual uh, continuum. So we talk about abdominal hypertension when the pressure goes above 12 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and this is graded grade one to four. And a compartment syndrome exists when the pressure goes above 20 millimeters of mercury. So compartment syndrome is a yes or no, uh, all or nothing phenomenon. You have it or you don't have it, whereas hypertension is graded. But, and how do you recognize it clinically? Of course, you can measure the pressure, but clinically, the abdominal compartment syndrome will be identified by a number of signs. Yes, absolutely. And, and being an internist myself, I got fascinated by the syndrome over the years because it has an impact on each and every organ system within the abdominal cavity and outside. So it impacts on the lungs. It will cause... Uh, residual capacity going down, it will cause increased uh, alveolar pressures, it will cause increases in central venous pressures. So it has an impact on practically any organ system in the body. Let's go to the important question. How do we measure it? We just introduce, we just measure the pressure in the bladder, or do we have simple systems for it? Yeah, well, Normally, you should say that direct measurement into the peritoneal cavity would be the gold standard. You have a compartment, you put a, a needle or a catheter into it and you connect to a transducer. Um, but this is only done in patients with uh, ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or in patients uh, undergoing laparoscopic surgery where we limit insufflation pressures unto 40 millimeters of mercury. But it's not uh, straightforward in critically ill patients uh, to put a catheter into the peritoneum because of infection risks or bleeding or other complications. And also the catheter can be blocked within uh, intestinal uh, uh, parts or bowel parts so you would have an over or underestimation so that's why we go for an indirect measure which yeah. is a uh, bladder and a foley catheter as any patient uh, does have uh, a foley catheter in the in the ICU. and, so it's and how do we do it practically so we we use the bladder uh, as a passive uh, conduct for the pressure uh, outside the bladder being the abdomen and we transmit the pressure through the bladder through the urine to the outside. So um, basically we use the bladder and the urine inside as a transmitting medium. Uh, so we connect the pressure transducer to the Foley catheter, uh, we clamp it, we instill 5, 10, 20 mLs of sterile saline, uh, and then you can measure uh, the height uh, of the urine either as a column or via transducer. So there are these uh, non-invasive and, and non-expensive techniques. Uh, the Foley manometer uh, is called, uh, and this measures just the height uh, of the urine in millimeters of mercury, putting your zero at the mid axillary line where it crosses the iliac crest. Uh, and then you have your pressure at end expiration with the patient in the supine position. So as any body uh, pressure. So it can be done everywhere in the world, in every ICU, in, uh, in uh, uh, perhaps uh, less uh, sophisticated environments? Yes, because um, it's like in the old days when we used to measure CVP with a water yeah. column. Yeah, exactly. So you, could, you could do the same for, uh, for bladder pressure. 
or you could use just the drainage tubing if you have marks uh, on it, but then you need an air inlet for the meniscus to come down. Uh, and for this, there are very inexpensive devices that can be used on regular wards in ICUs uh, all over the world. So there is no need for a fancy monitor or expensive transducer. And so now I measure it and I find 18 millimeters of mercury. Uh, of course, I know we need to know the, uh, uh, the context, but just if we take a value, uh, I call you and I say, Dr. Malbin, I have 18 millimeters of mercury there. What should I do? Well, as you always say, we don't treat the numbers, we do treat the patient. So I would check and verify if the measurement has been done uh, properly, if there are no air bubbles or kinks or anything uh, that could explain if the patient is not in pain, up, uh, muscle contractions and, and these kind of things. So assuming that the, the reading is correct, that then the expiration 18 is already a, a high level, which is a grade two intra-abdominal hypertension. So, um, of course, we don't treat uh, pneumonia, septic shock, capillary leak, fluid overload with the knife of a surgeon. So the first step would be to start a medical management uh, algorithm acting on uh, different uh, levels and different ways of lowering the abdominal pressure. So this could be reducing uh, free intra-abdominal fluids. Like if there is a situs, if there is a collection, uh, we go to ultrasound CT and we try to drain we can reduce the intraluminal contents. If there is gastric distension, if there is ileus, uh, we can try to uh, promote uh, bowel transit, with prokinetics and these kind of things. Then we can try to improve the compliance of the abdominal wall, which is diff difficult to measure, but we know that in patients with obesity, uh, compliance is reduced. Uh, male patients or patients with a lot of muscles on the abdomen, they have a, a low compliance, whereas female... Yeah, but I, can, I cannot do much about it if the patient is obese or... <laughs> no, no, but based on anthropomorphic or anthropometry, you can have an idea whether this patient will develop problems if there is an increase in intra yeah. volume, yeah. whether it will have an exponential uh, increase. Yeah. So you can improve compliance by making sure the patient has no pain, by uh, mm -hmm. giving sedation, maybe muscle relaxants uh, can buy you some time, but not at a pressure of 18, that would be rather at higher pressures of 20 or, or 25 if you really have hemodynamic and respiratory instability. And then of course, uh, the final thing is to act on uh, the fluid balance and avoid fluid uh, accumulation and, and fluid overload, uh, because this uh, will lead to uh, fluid um, in the interstitium fluid, in the tissues, in the skin, making the chest wall uh, less uh, compliant, and, and this will further increase abdominal pressure. And the last thing is more... But, but if I may interrupt you, um, of course, we, we follow what you just said, but if there is some hemodynamic instability, as they say, <laughs> could we still try a fluid challenge, or is it a no, no, no? Well, of course, if, if, if the patient is in need and, and is a fluid responder and is um, intravascularly underfilled, okay, in the very hyperacute situation, uh, you should give, but I would go for a fluid challenge and minimize uh, the amount of fluids and look for the type of fluids, yeah. maybe some some albumin may be indicated. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's a holistic uh, approach. Um, it's interesting what you say that the... Uh that albumin administration may be indicated in these particular conditions with significant edema? There, there are some, some studies indicating in combination with uh, if there is fluid accumulation with diuretics or, or, or even yeah. uh, CVVH and ultrafiltration. Yeah. So it's a give and take uh, of trying to preserve intravascular uh, volume and flow and to reduce the excess in the extravascular uh, space. Um, yeah. but, uh, the fact that the pressure is increased, even if the patient is unstable, has an impact on the way we set the ventilator. So recruitment yeah. maneuvers are different, peep setting, best peep will be different, interpretation of filling pressures, abdominal perfusion pressure, the way that we're going to feed the patient or, or adapt the uh, enteral nutrition speed. So it has a lot of impact on the way we look at the patient and we can fine tune uh, the 
the other supportive uh, therapies that we are giving. So uh, I think it's a vital parameter and, and, and we should uh, measure abdominal pressure um, as we measure uh, CVP or arterial pressure or saturation or urine output. Um, very good. I think um, it's very useful. It's, it's, it's complex and it's, uh, it's good for the brain because you need to consider a number of elements and it, it's really good critical care medicine at the bedside. So thank you very much for... Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thing. Please, so please. You asked about this, what about the future? Because it's still cumbersome to go for the bladder. Some patients okay. don't have a bladder catheter. Some yeah. patients... Uh, have a contraindication if there is bladder trauma. So now we are working, and that's together with the, the VUB University and the engineers, on a technique which would be non-invasive using microwave reflection. Ah, uh, okay. This uh, will allow uh, from a distance to assess the reflection coefficients and this change when the pressure increase. So we just done a study in an in vitro model. And now the next step is to try in uh, animals and, uh, and in humans. So this could be something completely non-invasive. Very interesting. So we'll have more things to discuss in the near future. So many, many thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you, Manu. It was, was my pleasure. I'm gonna end with uh, the view from my new office. Beautiful, yeah. Yes. Having Excellent, with right. some fluids uh, just under your window. That's very good. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jean-Louis. Thank you. Bye.